See, we just today, I came up here and there's a white cross with a, I have no idea what that is. For nearly 40 years, Sheriff Tony Desmond has come out to this field by McDonald's Road. To check on the place, investigators found the body of 17-year-old Kathy Kaloje. The original investigators, including Sheriff Desmond, discuss the 38-year-old case, a murder they've never been able to get out of their minds. But one of the things that I remember about this the most is Mrs. Kolodzik, when she came to identify her daughter's body. It's always been there and always will be. Somebody needs to pay for what happened here. Let me say this, it was devastating. You know, the fact that, the fact that she disappeared to begin with, nothing like that had happened uh, on, on this campus. It was very tragic um, to lose a 17-year-old co-ed who, um, especially for people in the community, this young lady comes up from Long Island, embraces this community to learn and to spend some years of her life in, and for her to, um, be subject to this is, is heartbreaking for the community. You know, she was only here 60 days. There was a lot of unrest on campuses. Um, there was also a lot of partying that went on downtown. Bars were open, two or three bars, actually were four or five bars. Um, and the idea of going downtown to party was a, uh, a typical behavior. Um, you, you couldn't drink in the dorms, so everybody had to go out of the dorms. You know, when the rules changed on campus here, uh, things changed in terms of who went downtown and how they how they went downtown. Kathy had hardly ever gone out, seriously. She certainly wasn't a drinker. Uh, there were a couple of pubs in the village at that time. She was out uh, with friends at, at the vault, which was a local hangout for young people uh, in the village of Cobleskill. And they had bands, there was dancing and socialized uh, drinking. Back then, drinking age was uh, 18. But uh, she was out with her roommate and friends, uh, met some guys, they danced, they, and they visited. Um, at some point, her roommate and some of her friends left later on in the evening. Um, they asked Cassidy to go with her. She declined. She wanted to stay with uh, the friends she was with, and she, she would go home later. Now, back then, um, a lot of people walk back or hitchhike, bummed a ride is what we used to do. Um, nobody had cars back then, it was only one car per family. So hitchhiking was not uncommon. Um, even if she was walking along, someone would stop and, hey, do you need a ride? And you would, a lot of times you would jump in a car. So at some point when she left, we do have people seeing her leave the vault, cross the street and head in the direction of uh, Sui Cobleskill. And that was the last anyone saw of her. There was a supposition that she got into a car um, from eyewitnesses that was a small uh, yellow orange uh, vehicle. I kind of thought it was a Volkswagen bus. It was very much a lot of concern by the roommate, by her girlfriends. This was not consistent with Kathy's uh, behavior. Her parents uh, immediately came up from Long Island uh, within hours because they knew that uh, something was amiss. It was unlike her to uh, not be there in the morning, you know. Um, so we were uh, quite concerned right away with this. And of course, there was a blanket search uh, and media blitz, anything uh, to generate uh, calls if, if anyone had seen her in the village, get into a car or anything like that. We wanted to know right away because we were concerned. She was, had been missing for 30 days, so uh, we had developed information the day before where one of her shoes was located up in the Richmondville area. Uh, a search team had been prepared um, with troopers who were gonna, who were gonna comb the fields, the hills around the area on Cross Hill where her shoe was found. Uh, at that point, uh, this was in November, and it's hunting season, and a hunter came up uh, before the search got going and said, uh, I saw something down in that field, uh, like red. 
and she had been wearing a red winter coat. So the troopers went down and on a stone wall off of McDonald Road located uh, the body of Kathleen. She was discovered up in the town of Richmondville, um, partially clothed and stabbed to death. So what we think happened is whoever she met and got a ride with, um, and it could have been where she didn't want to get in the car but was forced in, you know, we don't know. But uh, there was an altercation between Kathy and this individual, or individuals, and, um, and she was murdered. It was thoroughly investigated then because that was a very good lead. Um, but we're not sure if it was Kathy that got into the, the yellow Volkswagen or not. Um, a woman had gotten up in the middle of the night and she looked out her window and saw what she thought was a, a young woman getting into a yellow Volkswagen. That was something we really looked into and anybody who had a yellow Volkswagen in the area uh, was thoroughly investigated and, um, and interviewed. It, at one point it took on almost too much uh, of the investigation where we were looking elsewhere too in the event that it was not her that got into the car. But uh, they were all thoroughly investigated back then. Now if we get information now that somebody says uh, so and so is, uh, we think he may have been involved, he had a yellow Volkswagen back then, again we'll look at that thoroughly. Right after the discovery of her body, the state police, the BCI, Bureau of Criminal Investigation, uh, members of the FBI came onto campus and actually questioned everybody. I mean, it was incredible the number of people they sent on campus to question everybody. They selected certain people on the faculty even, and I was one of them because I was fairly close to Kathy. Um, Anybody that had either a small car, or a yellow car, or <laughs> orange car, um, might have known her personally. Uh, we're all questioned. We were taken to a spot um, about halfway between here and Albany, up on a hill in a pink trailer in the woods, and they had a machine, I think we call them lie detectors, uh, and everybody was given a polygraph. Uh, and that, to me, was more devastating, I think. The idea that you could even think that I would do anything, right, to injure this kid, right? How could you even think that way, that you'd want me to take a polygraph? Of course I took it. How do you calm down when you think you're the brunt of an investigation for a murder? I don't know how you calm down. But the idea you're going to tell me calm down, it's like, yeah, right. I could really calm down. You know, the idea that you're even asking this question is absurd. And I didn't know how to deal with that either. And, and most people didn't. But I think that was pretty much the way it went after, after the discovery of her death. I, I do think the police, I think everyone worked the best they could, did the best job they could, by the way, uh, to try to investigate the situation. Uh, We've had leads most of the time or we keep reviewing and I'll have uh, younger keep people to review the case and they come up with different leads if we don't get people that stop by the station or call in uh, with different um, theories that they think happened or who they thought did this. We put a billboard up uh, in the community a couple of years ago with an 800 number for Crime Stoppers and you get calls from that. Uh, we would put posters up we would do articles in the newspaper, and this would just generate interest and jog people's memory. And these people would often call with, again, who they thought might have done this, and then we would do a background check. And a lot of these people have since moved out of state. We've had to go out of state to interview these people. Um, and a couple of times we thought we had a couple of good leads. We had individuals who were now involved with uh, another woman or had been and had been, uh, there had been domestic issues, there had been use of knives. So we were pretty high on a couple of these leads, but uh, none of them did pan out. But there are times when it's, it is dry with the leads, so what I'll do is I'll have young people look at this case and they'll come up with other interesting scenarios 
of who needs who we need to look at. So it does. It, we it, we do stay fresh on this, even though it's been almost 40 years. You think by now something would have shown up. You almost always you hear something, um, which is what makes me think it had to be somebody that was not from the area. You know, it's really hard if any if any of you folks are from rural areas. It's hard to keep a secret. I mean, over the backyard fences and down the street, and people talk. So if it were really something that happened and it was a local person, I would have thought that would have shown up by now, at least. The fact that it hasn't shown up and that the case is still unsolved really makes me wonder um, about how it, it could have evolved. I don't, I just, I'm not good enough. My brain doesn't work that well to, to understand how it could have evolved that nobody knew anything at all, ever. Um, I just think it should have been solved years ago. Um, but then I'm not a member of that enforcement agency that solves crimes. Early on, you don't expect the individual who did this to come forward, okay? That's very rare. But the fact that we didn't have information or anyone that saw what happened to her after she left the bar between there and the college, uh, that was very frustrating. You know, you have to, uh, you have to do a lot of work uh, in lieu of that, where somebody sees her, you know, if somebody sees her, someone trying to throw her into a car, you get to make a model of that car. Uh, that certainly cuts your investigation in half. Or in, in any homicide where they see somebody running away from the scene, you know. Um, but that's what's quite frustrating in this case, is that we didn't have those individuals to talk to. Uh, we, a lot, we had a lot of people to talk to who were with her at the bar, but they don't know what happened. It's not uncommon for people who, after a long period of time, who commit these crimes, um, get religion, and they will walk into a police station sometimes or, or make a phone call and confess to these things. And, uh, but unless it's people like you who are putting this out or in the media or through flyers, um, they'll let it they'll let it lay dormant, you know, but if they see that it still affects the community and the family, sometimes they will come forward. I mean, the abduction itself, first of all, tore them apart. They couldn't even function. We had, we had, I think, probably somewhere in 18, 19, maybe 20 students that had to take the whole week off from campus. And literally, who were close to Kathy just disappeared. Their parents called them and said, no, that's it. Don't watch you on the campus, don't even watch you in the area until the police figure out what went on. Uh, and it was for their own benefit, too, because these kids were literally devastated also. You know, psychologically, emotionally. It was like, oh God, if it could happen to her, I'm next. I would think that we've never talked to the right people. Somebody knows something somewhere. And I think we've never really been able to find that person or those people to talk to. Somebody knows stuff, um, how you get them to come forward, uh, what it would take, uh, who knows. I am still concerned because I think it could happen again. Never knowing the answer to what happened to Kathy Kalojas um, is not an answer that is acceptable to me.